Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There it is, so you don't miss any of our football content this season. It has been, if I might say, fantastic. All right, time for another edition of Sharper Square. Chad Millman, CCO, uh, Action Network, all of our odds provided by DraftKings. Uh, I don't have referendums or declarations very often, but officially I will never bet Trevor Lawrence again for the rest of my adult life. And I'm going to stick with that one. <laughs> the number of times I have made those kinds of declarations and then the very next week gone on to bet the exact team or player I said I would never bet again, including, by the way, last week when I bet the Carolina Panthers, because Andy Dalton was the quarterback, after I had sworn off the Carolina Panthers. So be careful what you say, because you might have to walk it back. All right, this is an interesting week. Um, so I usually feel, uh, first couple of weeks, I'm kind of feeling it out. I never used to feel that way. Uh, but because nobody plays anybody in preseason, fewer padded practices, I kind of feel like the Jets in week one offensively are awful. Uh, then all of a sudden you watch them and you're like, wow, they lead the NFL in third down uh, percentage. Like stuff happens fast because um, – the Sean McVay, fewer padded practices. I'm not going to play any starters, but I do feel like I have, um, I kind of feel like I have, I got my feet beneath me on the league, but this is an instructive moment. And, and I'll tell you, I want to start with this because I, part of why I like doing sharper square, I like teaching myself stuff and the audience. So I really liked the jets early in the week at minus six and a half. I think it's a bad spot for a rookie quarterback traveling, going back. I get a veteran extra rest. This is a bad spot for Bo Nix. I thought Tampa, I picked him in that week. That was a good spot. And with rookie quarterbacks, it's a lot of where you land and how the schedule looks. Same with rookie coaches, New England on a Thursday night, bad spot off an overtime game. So I liked the Jets a lot. And now it's seven and a half. And I don't bet teams. I bet numbers in this league. So now I a, like Denver. And just because of a point swing. So just as a point of instruction, how do the wise guys view that game? Well, they're going to bet Denver at seven and a half. And that's sort of what they've been waiting for. What you're doing naturally, because you've been watching football and thinking about this for a long time, is looking at the number seven. It's a key number, right? And a, the game key numbers mean that's the number, that's the delta of, between the two scores that a lot of games yeah. land on. In the NFL, seven, four, three, two, with the extra point changes the past couple of years, those are now the key numbers. And those are the ones that wise guys want to get on the right side of. So you liked New York at six and a half because it was on the right side of that key number of seven. You like Denver on the seven and a half because now you're on the right side of seven for Denver. So that is the delta, by the way, and that is the very, very thin line between success and failure. We're talking about a half a point in your logic, but that is the difference between winning and losing in so many of these games. So another uh, point I'm going to reflect on this, because this week I don't have as strong um, as a conviction on games, but I'm fascinated by why a number is. So about once a week, there is a number I don't understand. Last week it was Seattle and Miami. I had a winning week. I didn't get the number. Skylar Thompson against Mike McDonald's defense, that felt like a blowout to me. It's a hard place to play for Tua. Miami doesn't play well west or north usually. They're just a different team. So the Steelers minus one and a half going to be 4-0, best defense arguably in the league, against a quarterback who is in a Tebow level 49% completion percentage. I talked to an executive this week. He said his tapes as bad as a thrower as anybody he remembers. So I look at it and I think that number doesn't make sense. It should be Steelers minus two, two and a half to three. I would take Pittsburgh, but the market's confusing me. Explain the, the market line. is confusing you because the Steelers are undefeated. They opened as two point favorites and the line has moved in the direction of the Indianapolis Colts. And what's more, what you can see in a lot of places and, and most operators offer this, DraftKings does as well, you can usually see the betting tickets and the betting money. 
Tickets means that the squares are coming in on a side. Money means that the professionals are coming in on a side. The delta on this game is squares on the Steelers, money on the professionals. The line usually moves, I mean, money on the Colts, professionals on the Colts. The line usually moves in the direction of the money. That tells you that what the professionals are doing. The reason that's happening in this game is because A, Mike Tomlin is historically great as a road underdog and historically bad as a road favorite. They are also not believing in Justin Fields right now. They love the Steelers defense. They know if the Steelers get up that TJ Watt is going to slam the door closed and that's when he's amazing. But it's not like they're dominating teams. And if you even look at that Chargers game, it's 10-10 with a one-legged Justin Herbert and it doesn't become a Steelers win until Justin Herbert is out of the game. Now they're going on the road in a game that should probably be pick based on the talent levels. And the strength of the Colts is not going to be Anthony Richardson throwing or trying to evade TJ Watt. It's going to be what this offensive line, which is one of the top rated run blocking and top rated pass blocking lines in the league can do to get Jonathan Taylor free in the open field. So that's why the wise guys like this matchup. They're getting a home underdog and an overvalued favorite. Okay, let's get into my picks. Um, this line initially, I felt like Chicago was the play. It's now up to plus three. It's a coach quarterback league. Um, it wasn't, the Rams won this game basically on special teams, but now they have both their tackles back. The interior offensive line is now played together for three games. Um, so have these receivers. So the Niners were missing elements, but I don't trust Eberflus or Shane Waldron I'm not giving up a field goal to just a winning culture, to one that's trying to find their way. Bears are getting better, but I'll play the number. Rams plus three, sharper yeah, square. Yeah, three is sort of in the middle. We just talked about key numbers. If this game gets up to three and a half, the wise guys will play the Rams. But it opened at one. And the wise guys played the one, the one and a half, the two, the two and a half, and now it's at three. And their logic here is very much buy low, sell high, right? You just talked about last week. With four minutes and 57 seconds left in that game against the Niners, the Rams had a 5% chance to win that game. They needed every single thing to go right in that game, and it did. The Niners could not advance the ball deeper into the Rams' side of the field. They missed a 55-yard field goal. The Rams scored in three straight plays. The next play, the next series, the 49ers can't advance the ball. They punt. The Rams get a great punt return. They get three penalties on one play, including a 28-yard pass interference. They win the game. The Bears, meanwhile, couldn't have played worse. Caleb Williams was confusing Colts defenders for Bears receivers. They were truly terrible. They had no running game, right? 25 seconds left in the third quarter. They're still down 7-3. to three when the Colts score a touchdown to go 14 to three, five minutes left in that game, they're still down 14 to nine. They had a chance to keep winning that game. Their pass rush is elite. Their defense is getting better and better. You have to assume in this game that the bears are not as bad as they were, which is what the wise guys think. And the Rams cannot replicate that kind of luck, no matter who's back on the field. All that said, your statement, about Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford versus Ibra Flus and Kayla Williams is the one reason, I've talked about this game all week, it is the one reason why I have heard wise guys saying, I'm kind of hesitating. Those who are in are in, but those who are hesitating are hesitating because of that exact reason. All right, I'm going to take the Packers minus two and a half at home against the Vikings. Um, the Vikings are playing really well but they've always been a little better at home than on the road. Also, uh, Green Bay is winning without Jordan Love. The team is gaining confidence. Jordan Love is a massive step up. I also think Green Bay this year, for the first time in recent memory, is kind of a ball-hawking defense that's creating turnovers. Sam Darnold, historically, will give you opportunities. 
So at minus two and a half, Green Bay at home, I don't think people quite understand the coaching job, winning with Malik Willis and looking good with Malik Willis. These aren't fluke wins. I would swallow the two and a half, take Green Bay. Yeah, this is a really tricky one because there is just universal split on this one. It went to two. It was at two. It got up to two and a half. It got up to three. The wise guys took the three, bet it down to two and a half. You'll see it bouncing around back and forth. Everybody has an opinion on this game, and they are very strongly on Minnesota, very strongly on Green Bay. I can't give you a definitive answer. You could be right. Wise guys could be right. What's interesting in this game, I agree with you. Matt LaFleur has been a genius in this scenario and and you have to credit what he has done with Malik Willis. You also have to credit Kevin O'Connell, what he has done with Sam Darnold to make him look like an MVP worthy quarterback to get his team undefeated. You have to credit Brian Flores, whose team is number one defensively in DVOA and make Brock Purdy and CJ Stroud look mediocre to bad in two upsets for this team against quarterbacks who are really good against the blitz. Then there's one stat that keeps sticking in my craw. Teams that are short home favorites in divisional games, 45% against the spread since 2016. So I am completely torn on this game. Uh, I lean Minnesota. I'm hoping it gets back to three. Um, I like Seattle plus three and a half at the Lions. Lions are missing their top center. Byron Murphy, the really, really good defensive tackle, number one pick for the Seahawks, has elevated a defensive front. Um, I think one of the things about Seattle, I think they're one of the best coach teams in the league right now on the defensive side. Um, I don't quite feel like they finally figured out their offense last week with Detroit, 35 carries, Montgomery and Gibbs. But... You're not going to run like that on Seattle. Seattle has big playmakers. Detroit's always susceptible. If you can block Hutchison, Detroit's always susceptible to big plays. Three and a half is too big of a number. Geno completes 74% of his throws. This is a highly competent offense. Efficient, competent, and occasionally explosive. I don't trust the Lions here. Sharper yeah, wise guys still like the Seahawks here. If you can get the hook, that's what they're playing. The line has moved in their direction, even though it's Detroit at home inside when they are historically great against the spread. It went from four and a half down to four. Now it's at three and a half. All the things you said, there is some sort of hesitation because who have the Seahawks really beaten, right? Like they beat up Skylar Thompson and Tim Boyle. They beat up Jacoby Brissett. And by the way, the pass played tough in that game. And if you look at the spread, it was a push. They beat up. Bo Nix in his first game. And by the way, the Broncos came back at the end of that game and it was a push. So I'm not fully bought in on the Seahawks. They have been one of those teams professional betters have liked since before the season began. Um, the number play is the Seahawks, um, but it's not like a slam dunk for me. Um, and finally, um, there are games sometimes I just like to watch Bills getting two and a half at the Ravens. Uh, Bills in a short week. I said this. The Ravens are a toe away from just having one really bad loss and crushing Dallas and beating um, the Chiefs. I like Baltimore. They had to replace a coordinator and some offensive linemen. I think that stuff, especially on the O-line, takes time. Um I think the Ravens cover here. Totally sure. Square. Wise guys are on the Ravens. Um, that's the play. It, it's scary, right? You're going to be betting against Josh Allen, who is wicked right now and is now the odds on favorite to win the MVP after what he did to the Jags uh, on Monday night. I mean, he was fierce, right? His passes were pinpoint. He was running through the middle of that Jaguars line. But I do think that the value is on Lamar Jackson, who's 21 and seven as a short favorite or an underdog. It's a really good spot for the Ravens. Their defensive back line against the rush, they're getting a little bit better. I think the big fear is like, what are they going to do when Josh Allen is scrambling and improvising? They haven't proven to be able to really defend against that right now. We saw the Cowboys come back, but 
Ravens are definitely the right side. Okay, we do this every week. Uh, I have a game. I just want your opinion. So uh, the Commanders plus three and a half at Arizona. Commanders probably the side. But I will say this. Um, I don't think, and I've had this sourced. I don't think uh, Kyler Murray watches a ton of film. I think he's just sort of an instinctive player that's really good. And I think he can be beaten by very good defensive coordinators or secondaries that manipulate him. Um, but against bad secondaries that you can coach up to certain levels, he can embarrass them. Um, commanders are not good on the back end. They're really, really bad on the back end. Back end. They're coming off a short week. Arizona is one of the... Um, it's a little tougher to play there than people give it credit for. Niners and Rams will tell you Seahawks. It can be a tough place to play. Kyler plays very well at home. I know it's telling me to take the commanders. Short week, rookie quarterback, tend to be high and low in spots. I think I'd like Arizona, but I know it's not the play. What it actually is the you? play. Uh, your instincts are right. It's totally the sharp play. Y you said something really smart off the top, which was because of the preseason, and people not playing, players not playing as often as they have. What used to be sort of the week three get right spot for a lot of professional betters, like that's when you've got two games to see what teams are like. You've got a pretty good read on what their system is and their style. More importantly, you've got a read on the psychological makeup of betters. So you know what the bookmakers are trying to lure the betters into doing. That's happening now after week three and into week four. And you have some key buy low, sell high spots this week. We talked about the Rams and the Bears. We're also talking about the Cardinals and the Commanders. This is exact. This this line was five and a half before the Commanders game against the Bengals. Twelve hours later, it was three and a half. That is because of what they did in prime time. You of course want to fade a rookie quarterback who goes bananas in prime time and then is on a short week going on the road against a team that actually, while their defense is not very good, has been playing a lot better than people are giving them credit for. They are a tough out. And this is a really good chance for them to get a win and to put themselves, you know, to have some momentum behind what they're doing as a relatively short home favorite. So yeah, the right side here is Arizona. Okay, so my instincts were right. Okay, now there's a game, often an ugly one, that I have missed completely that you think is a strong play. It's usually involving Carolina or some dreck hole that I have to watch. Some it, just egregiously gross. Oh, it's it's terrible. Awful. It's Go so, ahead. it's. I don't even like to talk about them. Like what, ask, asking you to do these things. I could say to you, yes, you want to play the Jags against the Houston Texans. Okay, so tell the audience the line. It's Houston favored by Houston six, and a, six half, and a half, right, at home? The reason I'm not going to tell you is because I do think this line could get to seven. The Jags were so bad on Monday night. And because the Texans are becoming such a public team, and again, education for people, public teams are the ones that are so popular, they get an outsized number yeah. of bets. And bookmakers know they can make yeah. them bigger favorites because people are going to bet them no matter what, right? You're talking about teams today. It's... The Texans, it's always the Cowboys. It's always the Steelers. It's going to be the Eagles. It's going to be the Chiefs, right? Now it's going to be the Bills too. So you know the number on the Texans is going to be a little bit higher. Um, I think it might get to seven by Sunday. If it gets there, you're going to see a lot of wise guys coming in. The truth is, Colin, you hit the games that I'm most excited about. The game that I'm most excited about is the Colts and the Steelers. That just to me feels like the right play on the right team at the right time. Oh, so the Colts are at home and they're getting a yes, point now. Like you, I, I want to play the home underdog in that spot. I actually, I don't want to play the Panthers this week at all. Like to me, it feels a little trappy. Uh, people do want to play the Panthers. Yeah. They want to play Andy Dalton. They want to fade the, the Bengals. That one feels a little bit scary to me. I'm looking at my notes right now, but like we... We basically hit them all, like Arizona, Chicago. Yep. Um, the the one I will say, and it's terrible. Los Angeles Chargers, seven and a half point. Okay, give people the seven line. Seven and a half point underdogs at home against the Chiefs. 
So the Chargers getting with a limpy Justin Herbert and no offensive tackles, seven and a half against Maybe KC. it would be Justin Herbert or maybe Taylor Heineke. Like, we don't even know, right? It could. We don't know what it's going to be. But matchup-wise, what the Chargers really want to do is run the ball. We've seen this with Jim Harbaugh. Like, this is his gift, right? Jim Harbaugh, the reason he can come in and turn teams around so quickly is because he speaks to the primal nature of all football players, which is, we're going to go beat the crap out of the opponent. And that is what he gets these guys to be good at really, really quickly. And he's got a preternatural gift for identifying offensive line talent. So obviously there's challenges here because Joe Alt is out. Rashawn Slater is out. But I do think this team is going to be able to run the ball against a Chiefs defense that just hasn't been good against the run. And look, we saw that against the Falcons, right? When the Falcons had all of their linemen on the field, they were going to win that game going away by running B. John Robinson. And then they had to completely change their game plan. So I do think the Chiefs are going to, or the, the Chargers are going to lean into the Chiefs running game, or the Chiefs running defense, and try to keep this game, the clock running, and keep it low scoring. And you do get an advantage when you are playing a very large division underdog and Patrick Mahomes, because he's always a big favorite, has a harder time yeah. covering the spread when he's a big favorite. Chad Millman. All of our lines, DraftKings, fingers crossed. Good to see anybody. you too. Always fingers crossed. <laughs> Always. <laughs> see you later.